Hello, everybody, and welcome. Um, I am only here to introduce the program and the program people. Um, I am Christine Fries. I'm the assistant director of the Portsmouth Public Library, and we are thrilled to be partnering with the Black Heritage Trail on this series, which is several years old, and we're thrilled to be hosting it here in the library. Just a couple announcements from us. Um, we are live streaming this on our Facebook page. So as the folks out in the hall know, if we have overflow, people can go upstairs to our special collections room where we have chairs set out with a screen to watch from upstairs. So uh, with that, I will turn it over to Black Heritage Trail and good luck. Good afternoon, everyone. And welcome. This is an exciting day. My name is Sandy. I am the president of the Seacoast African American Cultural Center right here in Portsmouth. And I'm excited to be here today. A few little housekeeping things. Please silence your cell phones. Um, the other is that if there are any minors here, the parents, we need you to sign a release form for us if we haven't done that already. Yeah, if you haven't done that already. Um, uh, as she said, this is being streamed live um, on, on YouTube. And if anyone does not want to be filmed, there are a few extra chairs over here on the side that you're welcome to take or upstairs in the room that um, was just spoken about. Um, and it's also being videotaped for the Portsmouth um, Public Media TV. It'll be on the Black Heritage Trail um, website as well. So. You'll be able to see yourself. And the prior ones have always been um, videotaped as well, just so that you know. Um, a quick thing, um, the Shadows Fall North movie, which was supposed to have happened, was canceled due to the storm. So just a reminder, they have rescheduled it for April 3rd. OK. So again, I just want to thank you, the volunteers, staff, and the board of the Black New Hampshire um, the Black Heritage Trail of New Hampshire would like to thank you all for attending the 2018 Tea Talk programs. We hope you have enjoyed participating in the stimulating and engaging dialogues, and we look forward to seeing you at our next event. We truly appreciate you being here. Today we have some young panelists, which we're all excited about. The subject is, I Can't Breathe, musing from a new generation of New Hampshireites. When we mark down our history through a form of memorization, we not only ensure that we will not forget the person or event paid tribute to, but that our future generations will have this knowledge as well. Hear from a group of young New Hampshire residents about their journey to self-discovery as people of color in a state often described as the lily white. I'd like to introduce our moderator, Kate Bonds. Thank you, Sandy. Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Wonderful. So my name is Kate Vaughn, and I'm a UNH alum and a longtime volunteer for the Black New England Conference, which is coming up in October. So uh, mark your calendar. So I'm going to be the panel moderator today. So I'll briefly introduce our wonderful panelists, and then they're going to speak for a while about their experiences. And I will ask them a couple follow-up questions. And then uh, roughly the final hour will be open to questions and dialogue between the audience and the panelists. So I'm just going to go down the line here, starting with uh, Denabari Adumene, who is a senior at Memorial High School and plays varsity basketball. Welcome. Um, yeah, you can clap. <laughs> and next we have Grace Wilson Caudill. And uh, I'm going to read a little bio about Grace. So she's a USED scholar to the CAS program in 1996. Um, Grace attended Kennedy State Kentucky State University, a historically black college, and is Kentucky's um, in Kentucky's capital, Frankfurt. Grace served as both a cultural ambassador and an academic scholar for two years in the capital. She was prestigiously commended with the title of uh, Kentucky Colonel by Governor Paul E. Patton in 1998. She later earned two Bachelor of Science degrees in Network Engineering and Computer Science from KSU and continued on to earn a Master's of Science in Computer Security. And over those years, she mothered three children, two girls and one boy. She, 
<laughs> busy. Um, she worked for the Kentucky state government and other private organizations all the while volunteering in communities of Frankfurt and Lexington. In 2016, she accepted a position at the University of New Hampshire in IT and relocated her family to Durham. In June of 2017, and located and relocated in June of 2017, she is currently enrolled in the PhD program for computer science. Uh, Grace enjoys the sceneries of the seacoast as it reminds her of the oceanic beauty of her old homeland, Jamaica. As in the words of Bob Marley, one love, one heart, Grace believes all people are created equal by God. Welcome, Grace. And our third panelist is Jubilee Miranda Byfield. Uh, she's a junior sociology major at the University of New Hampshire. She is an intern and tour guide for the Black Heritage Trail of New Hampshire. And she is very passionate about social activism and helping to bring effective and pertinent change to the African American community. Um, she one, ho one day hopes to change the world for the better. And a quote that drives Jubilee is, be the change you wish to see in the world. Welcome, Jubilee. And then we have Lidette O'Connor, who is a junior at Winnicott High School. Um, she enjoys community service, playing sports, and going to the beach with her family. She is a recent member of the National Honor Society and has a passion for traveling. Welcome, Lidette. <laughs> and last but certainly not least, we have Betty Stevens, who is a junior at Trape Academy in Kittery, Maine. Welcome, all of you. So we're going to put Denavari on the spot to begin. <laughs> so as you know, my name is Denavari Dumine. Um, I'm a senior at Memorial. And so I'll be talking to you about my journey to self-discovery. So I started off um, in a poor neighborhood in Manchester with just my mom. And I never really had any male role model in my life. so. My mom was really all I had, and that's what I've been used to. Um, and I never really had someone who was a good father figure to me until I moved um, into a neighborhood where I was pretty much the only black person. Um, but I made a new friend who was an Asian American, and he really uh, was like a support for me throughout these years. And, and his father um, brought me to baseball games, helped me uh, with school, and just really was a mentor to me. So that was kind of how I became who I am today, it's from somebody um, like that, just taking an opportunity to really uh, make me into the man I am today. Also, um, middle school was a vital part of my journey to self-discovery. In middle school, I met other kids like me um, that were black as well, and I learned about their backgrounds and uh, what uh, countries they were from and stuff. And uh, I met one of my best friends, Glaudi, who um, was really like me, and he had the same interests as me. And so I was able to grow a good friendship um, throughout middle school with him, and that really supported me um, to know that I'm not alone. I have other people who feel the same way as I do and are treated the same way. Um, and so middle school gave me the experiences needed to understand how important knowing your identity and value is because people are always trying to tell me what I can't do, what I should do, what life is like, what can't change. but knowing who I am and knowing where I came from really helped me because I can just step over obstacles because I know uh, the potential that I have within me. Um, my first year of high school, it was an uh, exciting and fresh start for me because I was able to meet new people. Um, but it was definitely, I think, the biggest challenge of my life because going into high school, no one really expected me to excel in anything. Um, and most of my other friends were kind of going down the wrong path. And so everybody kind of gave 
gave up on me and, and lost faith in me. But I think that pushing myself and self-advocating for myself um, really showed people that I'm not just like a, uh, every other black person. I can have actually do something with my skills and talents. And so, you know, taking AP classes in, at my school and being the only black person, I was really like showing my teachers that I really care about my future despite having no male um, in my life, no father in my life. I still um, am working towards uh, making myself into a better man than my, what my father was. So um, as being a leader in my school, I really try to be an example of someone who, you know, takes, takes control of their future, takes life seriously, and, and really chases their dreams. And so there's this, um, there was this picture of Martin Luther King um, in one of my teacher's room. And I just remember, like, I was, uh, had a test, a big test that day, and I sat down, I was, I knew the material, but I was just stressed out, and I just didn't know anything. I looked at that picture, and it spoke to me because what Martin Luther King did for me was uh, crucial because because of him, I was able to sit in that class and take that test and be in AP class. So um, just having, just seeing that really motivated me to, uh, move further with my life and so I just want to give back to the community and I want to dream big just like Martin Luther King did so being here today is one of my dreams and so I'm glad to speak to you guys. Hi everyone, I'm Grace Wilson Caudill and um, I want to start off by talking about self-identity and I could not hesitate to talk about that because as Danny Barry mentioned, knowing who you are as a person with a soul, with a heart, with love in you is most important and um, in spite of your social economic background, in spite of how your family structure was when you were born into this world. We are all created equal, and we are created with a purpose. And so, um, as he mentioned self-identity, uh, growing up in Jamaica, I knew who I was, and that was beautifully and fearfully made. And when I decided to come to the United States in 1996, I knew that I was coming here for a purpose. I did not know what the future held, but I knew that out of all the many students that were eligible and who could have been given a scholarship by the United States Agency for International Development, USAID, I was one of the privileged 16 from Jamaica amongst 300 others from other Central American countries who came here to study. And so based on my area of interest, I was sent to Kentucky State University because that was where those who wanted to major in technology would go to study. And so while I served in uh, at Kentucky State University, I majored in electronics technology. I believed in the concept that to whom much is given, much is expected. And our scholarship coordinator, he made sure that we understood that. We got a lot from the American people, and it was up to us to show our appreciation, and we gave back. We gave back through community services. We gave back through volunteering in the schools, whether it was the middle school or the high school. But we, we did not just talk about our homeland and the food and the dance, which we all like as people. We like to enjoy the food. We like to enjoy the music. We like to enjoy the culture. But when it comes to deeper issues that are humanity focus, we tend to shy away from those things. And we do that because there is something within us that is uncomfortable, and something within us that makes us feel as if we 
we are afraid. We are afraid of the unknown. We are afraid to give up our comfort zone. We are afraid that those who look different because of the texture of their hair or because of the color of their skin, we feel afraid of them. I have been told in no uncertain terms that I'm afraid of you because that's just how it really is. If you don't know about something, you have a sense of fear about it. If you see someone who might appear to you to be dominant, then you're fearful. You're fearful that they may make you feel uncomfortable. You're fearful that they may make you feel inferior, when in fact they are not superior, nor are they inferior to you. It's your sense of core values. It's your sense of personal upbringing. It's how you were raised. It's how you were taught to look at someone else just because they do look different, just because they speak with an accent, just because they may not have the same privileges that you have. And we talk about white privileges. We talk about privileges of growing up in America where the majority is, is Caucasian. And we don't look at the reality that because someone's skin pigmentation might be deeper than yours, they are not different. My husband is Caucasian, and I remind him all the time, and he needs no reminder, but I remind him that he is created just as equally with the same attributes. The nose is in the same place. The eyes are in the same place. We all bleed red, though folks in Kentucky think they bleed blue because of UK wildcat, but the reality is we are all <coughs> created equal. And if we can get beyond what we think is the differences or the differences that are keeping us apart, we would create such a better world of one love and unity and one heart as Bob Marley sings about. When I came to the United States, there was no experiences within my 18 years of development that taught me that I was inferior or tried to make me feel that because of the color of my skin, I was anyway less than the other person. In Jamaica, we have people that are Caucasians, we have people that are uh, Israeli, we have people that are Asian, we have people that are black. And our motto is out of many, one people. We're all one people and we don't see color. We literally embrace all people and that's why we have that Jamaican saying that everything is all right, man, because <laughs> we go around believing that everyone is created equal. And so the reality struck me when I came here in 1996 that because of the pigmentation of my skin, I may not be received like others received me in Jamaica. In Jamaica, I was just a smart little girl from the countries of St. Elizabeth, the hill country, and that was it. I was never discriminated against by my teachers because I was black. I was never told I couldn't do anything because I was black. I was never told that I would have to work twice as hard because I was black. And so when I had children here in the United States, I grew them for the first 16, 12, and eight years of their lives in the, with the ideologies that they can do whatever they want to do, and they would never have to consider the fact that their skin is darker than the majority of Americans. And so when we moved to uh, New Hampshire in 2017, and that reality struck my eight-year-old son, it really created quite a, a stir, it created quite a void, and it created quite a, a, an uncomfortableness that African Americans have had to deal with for years, something that I never had to deal with and something that I, I swear over my body, my children would not have to deal with because I was going to make sure they know who they are and they do. But the reality of America is that from a very tender age, children who are instructed of the adults will go forth and say things to other children that are very unkind because the adults themselves were not taught one love. They were not taught equality. They were not taught that they're not superior because of the pigmentation of their skin. In fact, if you go back to history, 
and you look at where the African people came from, and you look at civilization, you will know that blacks were highly civilized, highly educated people. But because of slavery, we were brought to America. We were brought to, brought to the Americas, and we were stolen from our motherland. But we are created equally. We are created fearfully. We are created beautifully. And we are not inferior. So for those in the audience that had to grow up with that notion, who are African Americans, who are black, who look like me, who were told you can't do this because you are black and because you are not the majority. Remember this, coming from a Jamaican who grew up in a country where she was never told she cannot do something because of the color of her skin. You are beautifully and wonderfully made and you can be all that you can be because the same hands that created the white man and the white woman, it's the same hands that created you you are no different, and you can accomplish all the talents that were given to you when you were first created. And so those are the things I would tell my children, and they knew that. So when we came to New Hampshire a year ago, and, and our son on a school bus was ostracized, abused, and told that he is inferior, you can only imagine the pain that I had gone through those of you that can really feel because had, had I had to experience that growing up, I would have prepared him. <coughs> I would have told him, people are going to say these things to you. People are going to try to make you feel inferior. But because I did not have to grow up with that, I did not prepare him at seven years old because to me that was something you don't experience at such a tender age from a peer. A peer, another person at seven years old, would have told my son the things that he told him. And not only did he tell him those things, he physically abused him. And so it took everything in me that I was taught as a mother, as an African maroon growing up in St. Elizabeth, to find the self-restraint, to find the courage to take the higher road, as I was taught, and to bring about some change. And so right there in Durham, we have created a group called the Make a Difference Coalition, the New Hampshire Make a Difference Coalition. And so if you're ever in Durham, we have a meeting at the Durham Public Library every other Wednesday. We've changed it to Thursday evenings, and so you're welcome to join us. You're welcome. These are meaningful parents from the Oyster River Corporate School District. The superintendent has taken tremendous uh, steps to make a change in his district, and that change has been recognized nationwide, um, statewide. He has been awarded the uh, Superintendent of the Year for New Hampshire, and I can only attribute some of that to what he has done. He has trained his entire staff uh, of over 400 people on diversity. He has trained them on how to um, have discussions that make them feel uncomfortable. He has reached out to the University of New Hampshire, who are now involved with the Oyster River Corporate School District. And people are having those uncomfortable conversations, which in my mind, it really befuddles me as to how uncomfortable you could, you could feel to talk about a, a mere difference of, of, of culture, a mere difference of ethnicity. Ethnicity is really from the three different uh, uh, groups. We're all of the human race. We are all human. We are created with all the same attributes. Um, we have seen President Obama serve for two terms in the White House. And to, two years after he has served, to see a state as, such as New Hampshire, one of the first states in the United States, to still be having conversations around race. It's a, it's a start in the right direction, but it's a little too late. 
but it's never too late for a shower of rain is what my mother always say so it's good that we are having some rain because from rain good things grow and so I do believe that the, all of you here today you're here because you want to see good things grow from what has been dormant for a while and for the change that we all need to see um, come about. And so I applaud you for coming out and um, on that I'm gonna digress and you're free to ask me questions as you feel fit to. Thank you. Hello, um, my name is Jubilee Byfield, and I'm going to talk about growing up as an African American in predominantly white towns. So I grew up in um, Durango, Colorado, and the population of African Americans there was 1.5%. And then coming to Durham um, around eighth, my eighth grade year, um, it was predominantly, it's a predominantly white town with I think 2.5% diversity. But um, growing up here, you know, I've, I grew up with, I'm half white as well as um, black, and I've grown up with my white mom and my, my, my um, family, and I've le really learned to try not just to focus so much on color, but growing up with, like, a white mother, you, you get to be in a community and you see, like, from a different side of the veil, like, what... W.E.D. Du Bois talks about, if you've ever read the book, The Veil, and I really, um, I really saw growing up that I grew up with different advantages than my other classmates who were very dark and grew up with um, African American parents because they were treated oftentimes more harshly than I was, so I grew up very privileged when it came to that aspect of things. I was a lighter African American, but I was still black. I wasn't averse to racism. So like I had a lot of little racist experiences, like I would be told, you talk white, which African Americans and white people both do, and it is very alienating and isolating to young African Americans when we say things like that to them, because in, it in further tells them that how are they supposed to sound uneducated and black, and so black people sound uneducated, is that what you're getting at? But my point with that is you grow up with little racisms. I got little things like that when I was growing up. And I wanted to further my education. I got a lot of help going in high school. Like I've always had a very supportive system surrounding me, my family, my friends, my teachers. But um, I wasn't adverse to the racisms or the prejudice growing up in mainly white towns. My original thought in going into UNH was, I don't want to go to UNH because it's too close to my family. <laughs> Not because it's, it's um, 1.5 diversity, not because, you know, there's not a lot of um, programs for African Americans, but because it's 15 minutes away from home. But, <laughs> but you know, I've learned to love it. I get to see my, my beautiful family every other weekend or so. <laughs> and um, I, but at first I was super nervous about it. The summer going into freshman year, I decided to go random with my roommates. Um, I didn't want to live with my friends because I, like I said, I already lived 15 minutes away. I knew a lot of people. I kind of wanted to broaden my circle with people I didn't know. So I decided to go random and I got two girls from Maine and one from Lynn, Massachusetts. And we were in a forced triple and um, I remember I was with my cousins who were also white and they said, I was like, oh no, I hope they're not racist, kind of off, like just offhand, kind of a joke. And I started laughing and they're like, why would you say that, Juby? Like, they're not gonna be racist, that's not gonna happen, you're gonna have a great college experience. And you know, I was like, you're right, I'm gonna look at it from the best I could. And for months it was fine, we lived together, we had, we would do normal, like roommate things, I would always ask them if they wanted to come. They were so super cool. One day I walk into my room with my friend who was African American as well, and my roommate was on the f FaceTiming her boyfriend, who's a firefighter in Maine, and he goes, what's up, nigger? And I said, excuse me, what did you just say? And he said, 
what's up, nigger? And I said, since when is it okay to say that? And he said, since forever. And I said, well, it's not, and I'm not staying here. So I got all my stuff, and I left the room right then and there. The next morning, I wrote out a very strongly worded email to the University of New Hampshire saying that I did not deserve anything less than my white roommate who got to stay in the room because, of, because she's white. Do I get to stay in the room for the rest of the year? Having her boyfriend come in and out, him FaceTiming her, feeling uncomfortable, a, like, a, like a little pain in my soul every single time I have to hear his voice, just saying I'm less than him. He gets to say that in my room to me. As I'm going out with my friends, he gets to make my whole world turn black inside out by that simple word. So I go the next day and I say, I'm not going to live with her anymore and I don't want her in my room and I want the boyfriend banned. The University of New Hampshire was very helpful with me. They actually, that day, made her leave the room. The boyfriend's still not allowed on campus. And... Um, she apologized profusely, but she didn't really apologize until her mom told her that she should apologize and that her boy, she said she was going to try and get her boyfriend to apologize to me. I said, I don't need you to try and get your boyfriend to apologize to me. I think you should break up with your boyfriend. You're better than that, girl. But he... Um, <laughs> but... Um, you know, it's hard to always say something when you're in a situation like that. I, I was walking into my dorm room, a place I was supposed to feel extremely comfortable. That's where I was living. That's where all my property was and everything. Like, that was my dorm room. And I, still, I almost felt like, am I going to say something? Should I say something? Is anyone going to listen to me? This kind of thing happens all the time. But it's always important to speak up and say no. That's not okay. You can't talk to me like that. I am who I am, but you, you, don't have the, you don't have the right to degrade me because of my skin tone. You know nothing about me. Don't say that in my room. And that goes for everyone at the University of New Hampshire. They have a right to say what they want to say. And I know with all this stuff in the news and everything, UNH has not been very popular on race issues. We're 1.5% black at our school, and sometimes it feels even less than that. But all these kids that have been speaking up, I'm super proud of them, and I'm proud of them to call, to call them my fellow Wildcats, because even though they're in a white sea, and trust me, I, I've been there with them, it's, it's, I give them so much courage, and just I'm so proud of them for speaking up, because Lots of people come at you at UNH and they pretend like it's, um, it's not that big of a deal, but then they'll say things in class when a teacher's saying an example and you'll be like, that was kind of passive aggressive, but like you still have, to, people like to go undertone with it when it, with it, racism at UNH and I just think it's really important to always speak your mind. It's really hard to be in that moment and say something. And I remember we had a panel last year at UNH talking about black experiences and how many people were being abused after the Cinco de Mayo accident. Um, one, one girl that I know personally was like her life got threatened, like there was blackface on campus, she got death threat notes and the university knew some of the students who were responsible for it, but like a lot of it was over social media but they didn't really do anything about it. And I know a lot of the faculty came out and I just I told my story to them. And um, one of the members said back to me, you know, I'm just an old white guy, but I'm trying. And I'm like, you know what? what, being white's not an excuse. My mom is white and she's the most woke person I know. So <laughs> there you go. And you can't just say, you know, I'm white. You have to say something, but it's not only white people as well. Like. I, I had an experience when I was at UNH where I was standing in the rain waiting for the bus and I was with an Indian guy and he was wearing a turban. And I had my headphones in, but I could just tell from the, his mannerism and how he was acting that the boy next to him was being very racist and rude to him. And I took out my headphones to hear 
and the bus arrived right then, but he, he saw his friend on it and he like ran over to his friend. And I thought to myself, I could have said something. It's everyone can say something and everyone has the power to change the world and make it a better place, even if it's in your little own community like UNH. I could have stepped up and said something right then, but I, you know, it, fear overcomes you. Why should I say something now? It's not my problem, all these things. But my point in all this is you can always say something and you can always make it better. Hello, can everybody hear me? Okay. Um, my name is Lydette, as you know, and I'm, I just wanted to say I'm honored to be speaking in front of all of you today. Before getting started, I wanted to acknowledge everyone here today, from the audience um, to everyone who put this together and the speakers. I want to take a moment to recognize the importance of what we are all doing. Whether or not everybody sees this to be true, creating a space to have conversation like these is much needed. So thank you all for being here, for listening, and being open to start a conversation about something that may not be easy for everyone. I'd like to, I'd like to first start off with talking a little bit about my past. I was born in Ethiopia and was adopted in 2007, along with my sister, by my adopted family in Hampton, New Hampshire. Growing up as a black girl in a predominantly white area had its problems from the start though I didn't realize the extent of the problem until a decade later. I was born in an area where everyone looked like me. Then my home, I was brought home to an area where no one looked like me. Understandably, I was mesmerized by my new surroundings. At first, I didn't see my color as a problem, nor did I see the children with white skin as a problem. At first, I just took in my very different surroundings, but little did I know that this innocence wouldn't last. It was in my kindergarten class when I first discovered, not that I was different, but there was something wrong with the fact that I was different. I was a couple of days into my kindergarten year, and that year being my first time that I had been in an American class, I was a little nervous. There was also the fact that I was the only black girl in the class, and most likely in our whole grade too. The teacher had asked us all to sit around on the rug in a circle and take the hands of the person to our right and to our left. There was a girl on my left, and I extended my hand, and she took it. There was a boy on my right, and reaching out the same way I had before, I was met with a different response. Looking at me, he pushed his shoulder back, retra um, retracted his hand slowly behind his back. I quickly put mine down and looked away from him. I felt like a freak and that something was wrong with me. That was the first time I had truly felt like I was an outsider. And from then on, my life was dedicated to proving that I wasn't different. Later, I would find this goal to be draining and also nearly impossible. The first step I took to try and achieve my goal of trying not to be different was to not appear in any way as a black girl. At first, that meant hiding my color as much as I could and trying to, to make my afro as small as possible, which was kind of hard to do. I thought I was achieving my goal, but to the outside world, I was the only girl on the basketball team that wore sweatpants to the game, during the game, and after the game, all in an effort to try to hide my color. As I got older, I began to notice the other stereotypes that others would pin on me before they knew me. This included coaches, teachers, and parents. I would talk to a teacher a couple, and a couple of sentences later, she would say, wow, your English is good, or wow, you speak well. I increasingly got upset at the fact because it went beyond English being my second language. In sports, some coaches expected me to be good at soccer and basketball. And in a recent year during a basketball tryout, a coach said to me, don't be afraid to go out there and rip the net. What's that supposed to mean? The problem with that, with what had been said to me was that I wasn't a great player. I knew the sport and I was okay at it, but I knew that going out there, I wasn't going to appear to them as they expected. But you know what they say about making assumptions. <laughs> However, my biggest struggle with being, black, being a black teen in New Hampshire was in school. My biggest struggle in school was, again, not conforming to the black girl stereotype. By the time I hit high school, that meant not being loud, sitting in front, of, in front so the teacher doesn't assume you're doing something mischievous, making sure to get A's, and not being sassy or rude. I did a good job at putting a show on for everyone all day, but as you know, once you're alone, you're stuck with yourself. So I often go home burnt out, and my family was left to deal with whatever energy I had left. I spent a decade doing this, perfecting my craft, if you will. But again, I would fail to realize that learning to accept myself is a lot easier, easier than trying to become someone I was not. In trying to become someone I was not, I mastered the art of pleasing everyone around me. I did what was right, I did what others wanted me to do, and I did what made me look good in the eyes of white people, all in effort to not look black. This, be 
uh, this became a bigger problem in the past two years. Other than speaking out about being clean and staying away from drugs and alcohol, I wasn't the strongest person when it came to speaking out black, about black issues. As you can imagine, it's hard to devote your life to not appearing black than wanting to preach about black history and why a white girl can scre cannot scream the N-word in a song in the locker room or on the bus. That was something that happened quite a few times and still happens. And the only way I could pull myself to stand up for such an unacceptable action was to lead by example. So I would sit in my chair, turn around, and make it known that, that way that I did not welcome such actions. Another incident occurred in January. I was walking to the library during break when I walked by a group of kids who were sitting on the bench and someone called the N-word to me. It took me a minute to realize what had just happened and, they, and that they were talking to me. I turned around and found out that the groups the group of kids that were there, I did not know them. The most surprising thing I found was, that, was the way I felt after the word had been said to me. Being called that word left me feeling dirty and inadequate. I encountered another closed-minded comment when the take a knee controversy started by Colin Kaepernick was taking place. There was a nice civil conversation that a group of us were having during one block. Being the only black person in the room, I off, an often occurrence, I thought it, would be, it was important to have a black person's perspective on the matter. So I said, people are allowed to have their own opinion on whether or not taking, the, uh, taking a knee is respectful. However, the only thing I think is incorrect to say is that they, do, that they do not have the right to take a knee because they do. One girl that I've known since the fourth grade look, looks at me and said, if black people feel so oppressed in this country, they should go back to where they came from. She knows I'm from, a, I'm from Ethiopia, and I knew that that was directed at me, but I still find this mentality, this mentality to be kind of funny. What do you mean, go back to your own country? Black people are born and raised here. All in all, I found this to be an enlightening experience to hear what some of my white peers believe to be true to them. I've spent the last decade hiding from myself and trying to be someone I am not. I'm black, and there's nothing I can do about that or to change that. And that alone was something that was hard for me to admit to myself for so many reasons. I thought for a while that being black was a weakness, that having a big afro and an attitude made me look uneducated. Hanging out with other black kids made me look tr like a troublesome teen. But once I got older, I started to notice different things that were always there and things that my parents had been trying to tell me for years. I began to notice strong black individuals that had, that had afros and were brilliant, hung out with other black people and worked hard to change the world and made being black look like a strength. I didn't know how to fit into this new world that asked me to embrace myself, not to change myself. So I often retracted to the world I understood, but then I became profoundly unhappy with the goal I had set for myself. Today, I work hard to become an individual who celebrates being black and learning how uh, to throw away my past ideals. I work to change my mindset, my morals, my stereotypes, not my appearance. I understand today more than ever the importance of building up the black community, building up myself and leading by example for other black children. To end, I want to leave you with a favorite quote of mine by Ava DuVernay. All black women aren't sassy, loud, difficult, or, or subservient. We are, in fact, very complex and very diverse, living very complex and diverse lives. That point cannot be made enough. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I hope you guys can hear me. Um, I'm Betty Stevens, and I'm a junior at Trape. And a little about myself, um, in the fall I play soccer, and in the winter I'm a ski racer, and then in the spring I'm on the cycling team. Um, not only living in a predominantly white state, like the rest of these women here, and young men, um, I partake in predominantly white activities, I guess that's how I'd word it. Um, so when I was five, I came to the United States, and I was born in Ethiopia. And I came with my biological brother, Berhanu, who was 15 months younger than me. And we came here, and we had two older siblings, Hannah and James, and they're both from the Philippines. And then my two parents, Mary and Chris, who are white. And we lived um, in Kittery, Maine, and we still do. And so kind of from the start, there was that culture shock. And I'd lived there until I was five years old, so I had kind of developed, I understood my family dynamic in Ethiopia. Um, the food and the culture was, um, the Ethiopian culture was really what had shaped me. And so coming here, you know, it was a shock from the 
climate, to the people, to the music, to the food, it, it was. And um, I adapted very quickly. I learned English in week, in amount of weeks. And my brother Brahan and I had kept our language for a little bit. And then one day he said to me, Betty, no more Hamaric, only English. So then we never spoke it again. And um, so we adapted really quickly and we adjusted to this way of life. And kind of from the start, at that point, I think at this point I was about six years old, I'd come when I was five. We, I had, I started kindergarten and I went to um, the Waldorf school in Elliott and um, was tied water. And so from that point on, till I was up until about sixth grade, I really had just kind of done what Ledette had done, just really conformed and, um, I don't really know where, how to word this, but I just adapted and I was a part of this group of people and everybody around me was white, my teachers were white, um, any kind of authority around me was white, so that's all I knew. And for a long time, color was kind of erased from my kind of internal being. And even though my parents talked about it and made an active point to put us, um, surround us with Ethiopians when we could and in the community we have here. So as I got older, when I started to discover kind of my self-identity and who I was as a person and what kind of life meant to me, that's when I started really realizing um, the greater world around me. And that was when I was about, I think it was about seventh grade. I, you know, my body was changing at a different rate than all my friends. And I, that was really kind of the first thing that hit me. And... Um, there was certain things that, certain subtle comments that I started to recognize at this point. And then eighth grade came, and it was kind of the same, but I had still really hadn't noticed. And then it was freshman year, and my freshman year of high school, I really wasn't expecting anything different from middle school. You know, I had the same friends and the same whatever, and nobody was really forwardly racist to me, if you want to call it that. I had really a lot of subtle things. And a lot of it was, you know, nobody, you're so white, you're the whitest black person I knew. And it hadn't really hit me what that meant. And I realized, you know, as I got older, how demeaning that was. And, you know, why? Because I am a member of student council or because I'm a member of the National Honor Society or these little things that associated me with white and that white was better than black. And knowing that I didn't really have um, a lot of black people influence, and a lot of people of color, because I am the only African-American girl in my class, and maybe one of three in our whole school. Um, I just, I don't know. So I got to this point where I had been actively thinking about kind of the greater world around me. And I had started learning about, you know, black history and what black American was and what African-American, what that meant and what that culture was and the difference between, um, African black and, and that identity among black people. And so as I started to learn about our African history and learning just about black America, moving on blacks and whites in this world that we live, um, that's when it really, really hit me about, that's when I was really forming my self identity and in that my privilege as a black person and the, all right, I'm gonna kind of redirect this. So at this point, I was a sophomore, and at sophomore, we learned about the transatlantic slave trade. And this was um, the time that Trump was elected. And so this was when the political attention and social justice issues and things were, that, were like, like that were kind of talked about in our school. And so after learning about the transatlantic slave trade, I was really, my head got thinking. And, and that was kind of the root and where I had the facts to back up kind of some of the feelings that I'd had my whole life. And so at this point, this is when kids were really vocal with how they felt and their outlooks and their parents' outlooks. And there was um, a group of boys that went to a protest last, um, this, that fall, a sophomore year, holding up signs, you know, like, build that wall and, you know, Trump, Trump, Pence, Pence. And so, and some of these guys were my friends. And so I like had talked to them and they were just like, Betty, like, you know, we're not racist, you know, whatever. And, and at this point I was, you know, this is unacceptable and this is so wrong. And, you know, I can, I'm, I'm your friend and I'm a person of color and to, and, and to stand up to them and say to them, you know, this is not okay. I, um, 
had at this point had lost a lot of friends because I was taking a stand and calling people out when they were saying the N word and making these horrible comments to other um, people of color, kind of beyond our community. Um, and then that year had gone on, and I said, you know, this is really important that I use my sense of privilege to take a stand, and knowing that maybe I don't face a lot of racial comments all the time, but that the greater world around me does, and that I created a group of allies and um, classmates and people around me, you know, stood up with me, but that was kind of the forming of it was just experiencing these little things well, being able to identify myself with who I was as a black American and my individuality. Um, yeah, so I think at this point, I was kind of thinking like I would tell my, a little bit about myself in that way, but more questions that you guys had that I could kind of have guide me. So if anybody has any questions um, at this point for myself, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, so that was the sophomore year start was when I did a, started a, like taking a stand. And um, last fall, this actual past fall, my junior year, um, a few girls on my soccer team and I took a knee and our community responded in a really, in a really aggressive, hurtful way. Um, and so, I, 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 yeah, I don't know really where I was going with that. But yes, so we, yes. We're gonna hold off. Oh, thank you. We're gonna hold questions and answers just for a minute while Caitlin, um, as the moderator, has a few things she would like to discuss. Give another round of applause for our wonderful panel. I don't think I'm alone in saying that we're very grateful to hear all of your experiences. Um, there's so many, there's so much that you shared with us. So I just want to start before we open it up to try to pull at some of the threads that I felt kind of united your very diverse stories. Because I do think one of the things that we heard from each of you is that there's a lot of diversity in the experiences that you each have, right? And so that's, um, that's a really wonderful piece of this program. Um, but some things that stuck out to me, um, I'm going to ask you about and see if you just want to share some more comments about those things. So, um, uh, Denabari had mentioned in the beginning this idea uh, when you were talking about taking a test and seeing a picture of Martin Luther King and what that meant to you. And I, I, it kind of made me think about a lot of you um, brought things up about mentorship or knowing yourself, right? And how you come to know who you are and how that helps lead you through a space where you're um, not in the majority or you're facing these hurdles that um, come with living in a white majority place. And I'm wondering if anyone else um, wants to share something about a figure or a mentor in your own life or you know, a figure from history or someone that um, has kind of helped to ground you in your sense of yourself or who you would like to be in the world. So I'm wondering if anyone wants to share about that. I'll share a little. Um, sorry about that. In regards to um, a figure that has helped to shape me and, and mold me into who I am today is... Um, we don't have a last name for her, but her name is Nanny of the Maroons. And she was uh, taken from, I believe, Liberia as a slave. But when she got to the West Indies, she was one of those African warriors that fought the British tooth and nail. And she escaped, and she was never made into a slave. And so as the slave ships would come to the West Indies, of which Jamaica was um, one of the colonies of England, she would gather more people who were also escapees, and she would raid those slave ships as they come in, and she would steal away the slaves. And she formed a band of people in the Akampong Mountains of Jamaica in St. Elizabeth and Trelawney. And those were called the Akampong Maroons. And so if you 
Google her name. Her name is just Nanny. She was an African warrior and she was never a slave. She was a free woman. Her tribe were free people. They, to this day, they are Jamaicans, but they're not under the Jamaican uh, government because they have their own government. They do not answer to the prime minister. And her courage and her tenacity in making sure that what was happening in the slave trade was exposed and that people could be free to live the lives that they choose to live. They did not have to remain slaves. She would raid the plantations at night with her men and women warriors. And I don't know how many of you have seen the movie Black Panther, but she was a Black Panther. And so she motivated me. The very time I, very first time I read her story, I knew that this is not a legend. This is someone that is real. It motivated me to live a life knowing that I can be all I can be because I was created with the ability to be all that God created me to be. And so she motivated me to go forth and to do whatever you want to do in life, to accomplish all that you desire to accomplish and not to allow the mental slavery which the, the, the people who are in this room, I believe, the Caucasians in this room are the Caucasians who want to see uh, a change. These are the Caucasians who want to make a difference. The, the, the people that creates and the people that continue to carry the negative um, leftovers from slavery and the horrid atrocities that were created and the legacy of slavery, these are the people that are not in this room, and these are the people that are in our community. These are the people that we have to show forth love to. These are the people that we have to educate about the fact that we're all created equal. And whether they receive it or not, we cannot legislate their heart, but we can show them love. And we can let them know that what you're doing is not right. And what you're saying is not right. We can be a white ally to these people. We can be a white ally even to those that look like us, but have hatred and fear in their hearts because these are the people that perpetrate racism. These are the people that perpetrate hatred and, and say mean and do evil things. These are the people that live in your neighborhoods. They don't come to these meetings. They don't come to these discussions. I can guarantee you that not one of you in this room is here because you, you're trying to target one of us. I believe you're here because you want to make a difference, and hence the reason why I share what I share, because I have, the majority of my friends are Caucasian. I don't see their color. I see their heart. I see the kind of person their soul is, and that's what gravitates me towards them. There's other people who might look like me that <coughs> they may not have a heart of love. That one heart, one love is not there, so they may not be someone I associate with on a deep level, but I still don't push them aside because they're the ones who need the most love. And so my charge to you today is to you know those people. They live in your neighborhoods. They might even go to your church, for those of you who go to church. They go to the same grocery stores. You see them all the time. My charge to you is, when you see those people, and if you are in their company, when they make those racial comments, and they talk about racism, and they talk about hate, and they talk about kicking out the immigrants, and they talk about uh, deporting all the dreamers, and, and things like that, you, it's your call to say to them, look, we're all immigrants here. This country belongs to the Native Americans. We're all immigrants, so let us show love and let us show appreciation because we are all equal. Let's appreciate everyone for the diversity that they bring to this America, which has made this country great. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wants to share about that? Or should I move to? Um, I actually had a mentor in high school. He's actually here, Dr. Hilson. He was just very important for, um, 
for me personally because before um, meeting Dr. Hilson, I hadn't had an African American teacher all of my life. And then to find out all this amazing stuff about him that teaching was his side job and he's too blessed to complain and you know, like he has all these adventures. I'm like, I can do that too. Like it was really cool and I just think um, representation on every level in America is so important and that's why people are freaking out about Black Panther right now because finally young youth are able to look up to black princesses and princes seeing them in these empowered um, these empowered like positions and you just you're like I can do that one day it's so important to have representation on different levels and like having Dr. Hilson um, in high school, he really helped me to find scholarships that my teachers weren't, like my guidance counselors weren't even looking at. He helped me to be in BSU. He helped me to like get a voice and like, like really look into like a different side of my culture that I wasn't used to. And I think it's just so important in America today to have representation on so many different levels because you can do whatever you want to do. And um, it's really important to see that for young black African -American. That kind of leads me to another question that throughout each of your stories, there were stories about school and schooling from kindergarten and middle school, high school through college. So I'm, I'm curious as we think about, it's clear that issues of race came up in schooling a lot, whether it was between peers or whether it was staff and teachers, um, maybe not knowing how to respond or not responding the right way. So I'm kind of wondering if you, if anyone's interested in speaking a little bit about what kind of changes would you have liked to have seen in schooling or would like to see now in schooling that would make um, finding your self-identity and feeling affirmed in it easier? You go ahead, yeah, I'll speak to that. Um, I think from just a young age, kind of looking at the principles of effective communication, knowing that race is such a complex topic to talk about, um, you know, really emphasizing, you know, what is it to empathize with people and have compassion and an ability to get comfortable feeling uncomfortable and addressing these kind of basic things that we all feel. And then really in schools, you know, addressing the facts and unwhitewashing um, the history we learn. And for me, that's kind of been a really big thing, you know, the, my t what my teachers are teaching me aren't necessarily very accurate. Um, to the facts and, and what's happened and being able to check that with actual prof other professionals that you know have done um, the research. So I think that's a really big thing too is just really admit schools and um, any kind of educating system to, to really, really put the truth out there to really dismantle any of these um, institutions that we have. Go ahead. <clears throat> so one of the things that I believe that we can change um, in the education system right now is um, empowerment, basically. So basically, if you want to further yourself, if you want to pursue your dreams, if you want to have a better future, a brighter future for yourself, um, they offer higher level classes in my school um, and specific um, areas if you were willing to take them. However, if you're a person of color like me, um, it's much harder for you to get into that class and you're pretty much discouraged from taking higher level classes because they think like you're just not qualified enough. And my first two years of high school, I was told like I should just take lower level classes because um, because of like my background and because I was just not uh, good enough, basically. And so having to work harder than my other uh, white classmates, it, it, really, it really built me because I, like, I had to really dig in and struggle. But now I'm stronger than I was before. But really, being a person of color, it should be equal opportunity to take higher level classes to better your future. Um, and you shouldn't be discouraged for wanting to learn more, to gain more knowledge, because that's how they enslaved us 
um, in the beginning, and that's how they're still enslaving us because they don't want us to have knowledge of other things or different things because they're worried that we'll be as educated as them. But education is the key, especially to survival in America. So um, just making education more accessible to African Americans would be a big step in um, just empowerment because education is just vital to success. And um, yeah, that's pretty much it that I have to say for education. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Um, yeah, so in, in my personal experience, um, I think what we could do more, um, I think it's even maybe like Betty had said, kind of touched on, is kind of educating our teachers a little bit more about um, how to handle different race um, situations if they come out. Because for me, um, because there are like probably like five to ten black kids maybe in our whole school of like 1,200 kids, um, you know, teachers will probably not have a black students in their class, like, and like, there's, you know, there's a big probability of that not happening, but um, I'm, uh, and I'm usually in a class, I, in like a, a topic of slavery that comes up every year, everybody turns around and looks at me, and I'm like, okay, like, this is kind of awkward, like, what's that, my, what did I do? <laughs> um, so, I, and usually my teacher's like, oh, like up here and like that's it and they try to like avoid it. And I think instead it's like okay well like why do you guys feel it's necessary to look at her? Like what's me and not like shame them for it because I think a lot of kids have been doing this all the you know since kindergarten since we've been discussing it and you know they don't really know what they're do that like looking at me and like kind of like that makes me me feel bad. I don't know for what reason because I didn't do anything, but um, you know they need to understand like what they're doing like it's it's affecting that you know for me, that one black person in that class. And like, I don't have another like a black buddy next to me, so I'm just kind of like, okay, it's kind of awkward. So I think it's important for, that our teachers understand that, okay, it's not, you know, I know it's probably awkward for you as a teacher, but like you and the other white kids in the class are looking at this one black student and that's, gonna, that's not helping them and that's not helping the white students around them understand that like that's not okay to do. And if you have questions, like what are your questions so we can solve it? So when you go up to, when you're in high school, you're not turning around and looking at that one black student again. And yeah, so that's my yeah, take on it. Can I just comment off that? Yep, Betty, and then we'll hear from Grace. Um, just that, off of that, is just really, I guess, the way you, um, one would be just putting, you know, teacher, like looking at who your teachers are and maybe putting people of color as authority and the ones that are your educators as well. But also some teachers, you know, we get into these situations with students and they feel to punish them, even though it's just a level of ignorance and just not knowing. And so I think really breaking down and adjusting um, that would be to, you know, take a more educational approach instead of, you know, punishing these kids because some, some kids don't know. So I think really, really digging in that is important. And Grace? I want to second what Betty said. It's really boils, it really boils down to education. Uh, for far too long, the education system here in America essentially has um, eliminated any kind of accomplishment from people of color. You talk about history, you talk about um, technology, manufacturing, the education system is so designed that you know, and, and those of us who are old enough know, that it eliminates any contribution that people of color has done or has given to the development of this country. You talk about um, Booker T. Washington. You talk about people who have created the stoplight that we all adhere to, otherwise we would be all running into each other out there. We talk about peanut butter, which we all as kids enjoyed, if you still don't enjoy peanut butter. They don't talk about the things that black people have contributed to this country because it's a mental slavery agenda. You can't shackle their hands and feet anymore, but you can surely try to shackle their minds, and so by eliminating the contributions of African America, African Americans from the American classroom, you, you tend to create this whole um, ecosystem of ignorance and, and fear, like you experienced um, uh, Lidette, where um, 
once the topic of slavery comes up, everyone turns around and look at you as if you were a slave. But you are not, because see, what they fail to educate the classroom on is that, yes, we had slavery. This is why we had slavery. Now, here's what the slave, the slaves actually contributed to the development of this country. The, the system is designed to not teach that, to continue to keep people in the dark so that they will continue to feel fearful and ignorance is bliss. And that ignorance will continue to drive that mental slavery that the system has created to, to make those who are of the minority feel less empowered and feel less uh, motivated to go forth and achieve their life's purpose. So it's a matter of changing the education system. And when my two children experienced uh, racism in the Oyster River Corporate School District, that was one of the highlights and what that was one of my desire to the superintendent. You have to incorporate education into your school system. You have to put books into your history class, into your social study classes that are going to teach these students not just about white innovators, not just about white uh, contributors to the American society, but you have to incorporate books and people that teaches these students about what have black Americans done for this country. And he, I am very happy to say that he has been working on that and the schools, both the high schools and middle schools, they have introduced books into Oyster River and they have begun to read more about the contributions of what blacks have done and um, it starts with education. Thank you, Grace. Thank you. So I hope you all are feeling as blessed as I am to be in the presence of uh, such wonderful folks. And they have been very generous with us about their experiences and their recommendations for change. We're going to open up to questions from you all. And Sandy and I think maybe one other person are going to bring a microphone around um, in the back there. There are microphones to bring around. If you are able and comfortable to stand when you ask your question, please do. If not, stay seated. Um, and I would just ask that we be um, mindful of our questions and to ask questions that we would ask a peer, to ask questions that are appropriate and sensitive to the generosity um, that our panelists have shared with us. And if there's anything they wish to decline to answer, they ha certainly have the right to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. I mean, this is an incredible experience. What you all have said has, um, it, it, it resonates in the community. Um, me and my wife, who had to escape from an appointment, um, we moved here from Atlanta, Georgia about six years ago. Mm -hmm. six years, six years. Um, I'm going to get a little emotional because I appreciate you. I really do. I'm going to tell you why, because you can see what I got my hands here full, you know? Um, my two older boys right now, they're ranking in the top athletically in their grades, fifth and sixth grade. And he's going to do the same. <laughs> when we moved here, they were in first and second grade. Uh, they didn't see it. They didn't see it. They were the only kid. They, they, they were the only black kid. You know, the only black kid in the school. It's can you can you touch base on being the only black kid with all white friends and some of the peer pressures as a student athlete? Um, Grace, thank you. I get a lot from people. Your children are so well spoken. That's what's going on. I grew up in one of the most gutter places in the world, Patterson, New Jersey. I moved to Atlanta, Georgia, the second biggest gutter place in the world. Prior to me moving here, I commuted to the area for six years on business. I, I, I have a background in nonprofit fundraising. 
I've worked with over 300 nonprofit organizations and I've raised upwards of six million dollars for nonprofits across the board. So, I know how to speak. <laughs> Either way, I can talk really, really hood or I can speak very, very intelligent and interact in a tax bracket that I don't belong in yet. Okay? <laughs> so, I say that to say, as a parent of multicultural children or black children, how did you, um, how, how did you, um, my wife tells me I have to dumb it down sometime because I've gotten to the point where, so how are they supposed to speak? How are they supposed to act? You know, your children are so well behaved. What's the alternative? So if you wouldn't mind touching base on just the peer pressures of, you know, being the only black child or student athlete, and then yourself is, you know, how do you deal with the, how they're supposed to speak? I think because I'm probably the only parent on the panel, I'm going to go ahead and answer myself. <laughs> um, you know, the reality of it is that we speak two languages in our home, and sometimes three. Um, my, a lot of people don't know, my, but my maternal grandma is Cuban, and so we speak Spanish too, and we also speak Patwa. But English being the predominant language of the land, we speak English and we, we don't pay attention to when we use English or when we don't use English in the home. But when we go out in the, in the community or out in the world of work, um, the reality is we've not had that um, personally said to said to our children yet <laughs> I'm hoping it doesn't happen but that's a fairy tale but the way I would respond to um, uh, those kind of comments to my children or the way I would teach them to respond to those comments to them is I am being myself and you be you and I be me and so, dependent on what the situation calls for, be free to be yourself. If you need to speak fluent um, Queen's English in a certain situation, go on and speak the Queen's English. If you want to speak um, quote unquote ghetto or hood, go on and talk hood and be yourself as the situation um, depicts. You choose how you want to speak in those settings and don't let anyone try to make you feel that you are not being who you should be because at the end of the day my daughter who is at Columbia, she has a plaque in her room and it says be yourself because everyone else is taken, so be yourself. <laughs> I think we have um, just other responses to that question and then we'll take Mabel's question. Okay, so um, to, to your boys, um, I mean, I'm not sure what it's like exactly to be like a, a black uh, boy or like a man in like uh, yeah, around here, but as a black teen and as a female, um, I can like, I'm, I don't think I'm, I need to sugarcoat it. Like you will, because you're um, in a predominantly white area, you will definitely have teachers that don't don't expect a lot from you or they'll expect the worst from you. I mean, I've had that happen to me. Um, you know, you will have um, kids that are also black that um, make the, what other people think are like the stereotypical black things that you might be, um, you know, getting into alcohol and drugs and things like that, and they genuinely believe that you belong in that crowd. And, um, you know, I think for me, how, how I've survived through it is to really stay close to your parents and what they teach you. Because for me, I know um, my parents being white has, you know, been like a, another like issue in itself as far as people see me and like, oh wow, you're so well spoken, da 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 da. And then they see my white parents like, ah, okay. And I'm just like, <laughs> okay. So I think you guys might be dealing with something a little bit different. But I think you know, 
what your dad just said, I think, you know, you know, he's teaching you, you know, what it's like to be, you know, just a good person in general and to stay close to that because as you grow, um, as you grow up, it gets harder to make the right decisions because there's a lot of expectations coming from different people you care about and you have to be um, strong headed in the sense, you know, to keep to your moral values and that will take you far and no matter what the stereotypes are, whether, no matter what other people want you to do or think that you should be doing, do what you know you want to do and what is right and believe me, um, it pays off in the end. It does. It pays off and people will remember you um, as you and not what, you know, other or stereotypes or anything else. So, yeah, that's my take on it. Off of that, I'm just going to comment kind of sum that up is kind of look to recognize kind of the powers within and something I kind of struggled with kind of growing up was just relying on the outer world and remembering the outer world around me is really white and it's, and doing that with my friends, you know, it took some time to just dig within and say, what is, you know, what do I believe in the situation? Because what I believe is very different and the experiences I've had is very different. So just remind yourself that all the time and um, I think also being able to have, you know, this not being alone, you know, your, your parents that are of both color and building those allies that are people of color and, and yeah, that's what I do. Okay, I'm All right. um, so just to answer your question, uh, what being a, being a black student athlete, um, there's a, plenty of peer pressures and it's, it's very hard to navigate that mm -hmm. rocky road. Um, and I know for me, basketball has been like one of the, my coping mechanisms that I use to kind of get away from all the distractions and all the disaster around me. And when basketball isn't going well, that's a bad thing because that's usually what I used to get away from disaster. Um, and so I remember <clears throat> just uh, my sophomore year of high school, I uh, planned to play basketball because that's what I wanted to do. And I, it was my first time playing high school basketball, so I, you know, tried out for the team or whatever and I got I was cut from the team so it was like wow like everything I wanted to do like it's just all gone and then I ended up like trying out again and playing JV and you know I'm usually considered a tall person even though I don't consider myself that tall <laughs> compared to other players I've seen um, and so everyone's like you know, you should be the best, you should be, you know, scoring all these points, you should be, like, the top athlete we have. And, like, it was my first time, you know, playing basketball at the high school level, so I wasn't, I wasn't prepared, really, to play, perform at that high level. And uh, I just remember my, I had a coach, um, and he was, he was white, and I had, I had other black teammates, but I really feel like, and I never, I never, the reason why I didn't say anything to them is because I talked enough to my mom about it, and it really, I, I let the coach know that I wasn't going to give up, and what he wanted me to do was give up, but I never did, and I remember I, there was one time after a game, I was just sitting in the locker room, and like, I was just, I just like had it, because like, all my other friends, they were playing varsity, and they're black. T they're black as well, so they're playing varsity, and I'm like on j junior varsity, and I'm always looked at as like not that good, and I'm not at the place I wanted to be. But I just remembered that one day I'll have my chance, and so, like in that locker room, I made the decision to keep going, and so now I was able because I kept going, I was able to continue. I was able to join varsity basketball and continue playing, and. Um, and my game has just developed so much since then. And so, you know, I plan to play college basketball and to keep going if possible. But, you know, it's sometimes you have to, you have to realize the potential within yourself, the greatness within yourself, because everyone is going to tell you what you can't and can't do. And you have to just remember that you have to keep pushing yourself and keep reaching for the stars because anything is possible. And so, you know, I spend a lot of time, more time, with my books than basketball, and I'm grateful for that because if I put everything on basketball, I wouldn't be anything. 
at the end of the day. So that's all I have to say. My comment is for the two Ethiopian girls on the panel. I'm a retired social worker. One of my colleagues during my social work days was Hallie Selassie's niece. Do you know who Hallie Selassie is? Yeah. Do you know who he is? All right. Your, your country in the continent of Africa was the only country never to be colonized. Most Ethiopians can trace their roots back to the Queen of Sheba. That's all I have to say. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just had something actually to say back to the boys. Um, so I grew up with mainly all white friends as well and um, I just want you guys to know that they're your friends because they love you but that, that, love, that love doesn't mean that they're not going to be ignorant towards you guys. And you know like you're all, you're, all three of you are beautiful strong African American boys growing up in a predominantly white town so you're going to get a lot of questions like can I touch your hair? Wait why are you freaking out about me touching your hair? Maybe because I just don't want you to touch it right now you know? <laughs> so like you're going to get a lot of stupid little things like that and it's not your job to make f people feel comfortable. It's not your job to be like um, well because I don't want you to touch my hair right now. No. Just no, you can't touch it, that's why. And you know, you're just gonna have to stick to your guns about a lot of things, but you also need to know that just because you're coming off maybe a little bit harsher to them, doesn't mean you need to be apologetic about it at all. You know, that's your right to say no. It's your right to be like, I don't wanna answer that, why don't you go and look it up online or something. You're not the answer to all black questions, so you need to, you just like, I just feel like that's really important to say. Thank you very much. Uh, there's a great deal of diversity in this audience and at the front table too. Each of us brings a heritage and I'd like to find out how you celebrate your heritage. Do you, what kind of customs, what kind of traditions, do you feel comfortable sharing your heritage? Is there anyone who wants to answer that? Oh. All right, I'll, I'll go. <laughs> Um, if I'm being completely honest, um, you know, me being adopted from Ethiopia and, you know, coming into, uh, you know, a white family and I, for a while, like I said, because growing up, you know, I was, uh, right away I kind of had this idea of, oh, I was black and then I was like, oh, there's something wrong with the fact that you're black and I was like, oh no. And so, like I, like I explained, I was um, talking a little bit ago that, you know, I was really, really, um, I don't know, I, I, I saw my blackness as such a weakness. I tried hiding from it for so long. And because I did that, I didn't really, you know, get to know my culture more. I mean, I went back to Ethiopia a couple of times and visited family, and that was nice. But when I came back home, I knew that like, if I embraced that, that that would make me look different, but little did I know that, that was who I was. So for me personally, I am behind and I need to do work on that. But for everybody else that's out there and that have a different culture and that are black, or even any other culture in general that other people may, maybe won't accept right away, it's really important to embrace it and not live for everybody else like I've been doing because you're, like I said, at the end of the day, you're stuck with yourself. And, you know, you want to be, you know, have a peace of mind about who you are because having that external, um, like, um, I don't know, not support, but like people out in the, accepting you out in the outside world, that's just such, so superficial and that won't last. So for me, I, I'm really behind on that and I'm trying to get there, but I hope, you know, you guys won't make that same mistake, you know, some of the younger kids out there. I think I want to share a little on, <clears throat> on about your question. Your question is, how do we celebrate our culture? Um, the culture of a land is what's common to the land. And so the culture of America is um, uh, Thanksgiving Day, it's Christmas, it's everything that we all celebrate as people. And so um, we celebrate it the same way you do. However, because we are from different ethnic regions, we have different 
culture, different heritages. And so we may uh, listen to more reggae music in my household. We may listen to more Caribbean music. We may um, uh, do the same things that you do, but we see it as being different because we have different melanin content. We think we are so different, but we're really more alike than we are different. So we have the same culture here in America. We, we do all the same things that you do because for one particular country, and we're talking about America, we're all celebrating Thanksgiving in November. We're all celebrating Christmas in December. We're celebrating the same cultural events. However, because of where we originate from, we tend to have different heritages. And sometimes some families choose to continue to honor those heritages. And sometimes some family choose to assimilate to the culture of the land. And so I can guarantee you that all five of us up here celebrate Thanksgiving. And we some of us may celebrate Kwanzaa. I don't even know what Kwanzaa is. <laughs> yeah. So the reality of it is we think we are more different, but we are more alike than we actually know. And it's just a matter of, it goes back to education. We really have to take the, the onus is on us individually to go forth and to learn more about other people's heritages and where they're from. And so, um, you know, that's a fair question, so thank you for asking. I think John Barry wants to share too as well, right? Yeah. <laughs> so the question was how do we how do I celebrate my heritage? Um so growing up in America, um just having my mom, I didn't I wasn't really exposed to my culture, um, except when I was around church. So Church was like, in my mind, I was thinking, church, culture, okay, those two go together. So this is what um, my culture looks like. But then outside of that, it was like, I, I never really was exposed to my culture at all. And I was just doing what every other kid was doing. Um, but when I get a chance, I really like to get out in community and, and spend time um, with people from the similar culture as mine because it really it really gives me a good diversity and helps me go back to the roots that I came from and I, I went back to uh, Nigeria in uh, 2006 and, and just seeing uh, my family and the way they do things it was a good experience because um, I don't want to forget you know where I came from because once you forget where you came from you you just start to try to become something that you're not. And um, so that's just what I usually try to do is just try to um, include as much as my heritage in my daily life and just uh, remember my culture. That's me. That's about it. Hi. Um, uh, my name is Patience, and I am the, the person that put my daughter in the all-white communities up there. <laughs> I'm the guilty mother. But my, uh, my reasons for that were complicated. Um, been a single parent since practically day one. Um, my, uh, really, I wanted to speak to you as a dad. Um, I did, though, uh, experience uh, prejudice from all sorts of different neighborhoods, all black neighborhoods um, and all white neighborhoods for the majority of their, their uh, youth, their growing up. But first of all, uh, you're a badass in any neighborhood if you're making that kind of money for nonprofit. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you should be uh, proud. And, I, I think, uh, and your sons should be proud, and, and, and don't, don't get upset that dad cries. That means he's a real man. Um, and, but my thing is that certain things help uh, approaching people and uh, the way she approached the principal. Uh, you have to educate people. You, you, you kids, she, my daughter's right, you don't have to answer every question, you can don't figure it out yourself, but you also don't have to assume that uh, 
people are going to just attack you because there are a lot of good people just like in this room. And so you have, but you do have to know there's an amazing amount of ignorance. I mean, I still, after all my years, have so much to learn. Does anyone have a question for our panelists? It looks like this young gentleman has a question here in the front. <laughs> um, Grace, um, those languages that you speak in, can you get, tell us some? Oh. <laughs> uh, certainly. Um, what's your name? Kavery? Kavery way I say. That means, how are you? And um, Patwa is a mixture of Spanish, African, and English. So that's the language that the former slaves used to speak in Jamaica. And it would prevent their plantation owners from understanding what they were saying so they could have conversations among themselves and not be understood. So it was also the language that was used to help the slaves that were brave enough to escape to the, um, the Freedom Mountains. So Patois is a very powerful language and it's a written language. So if you want to know more, um, just Google Jamaican Patois and um, I'll be happy to talk to your parents, send them some informational links. Yeah. So you would respond to me, Minasa Nutten, which means I'm okay. So. Um, so mine is pretty much, you know, I'm the mother of Dina Barris, the young man among the four ladies. Um, <laughs> um, so I just want to, I, I mean, most of the things that he shared, being, first of all, the only black male. He has always been tall. Uh, he still want to be tall. I think he's tall. Um, so that was a struggle, you know. I always, like the last speaker said, being involved in the school um, because he automatically falls into this statistic. Um, he's trying to reach out. He, to make friends and people and the other kids are like, he touched me. So that comes out being an aggressive child. You know, I battled back and forth with um, the school saying maybe he need medication, you know, yeah. because he's a black young boy. Um, statistics say it's this. And I said, my child is not a statistic. He's just trying to make friends because all the white kids are pairing up and he's alone. So I stepped in, I said, you can encourage friendship among the little kids then the teacher will have to be a friend to him, spend that one-on-one -on -one time with him. You know, so just little steps like that and just educate them and I have a very nice pediatrician who say no, this was nothing wrong with him. It's just those, you know, norms and the teachers at the time, you know, setting, being the tall um, boy, his feet was always longer and the seat in the schools are not as big as, so I said, why don't we give him the same seat like the teachers, right? So that he has, he's comfortable, you know, he's like moving the seat, I know, okay. And then he's trying to stretch his feet and he's touching people. So why don't we put him in front of the class? So just little things, every time we put all these little things in place, every, they complain, the behavior disappears. So, like they said earlier, you know, the education system, it's just those, the fact that he was black, kind of, oh, he's a black kid, he has to be hyperactive, he has to be on medication, oh, he's doing all these things. They forget that he's a human being, for, and he has basic needs, he's longer, he's taller than some, one of the teachers, he was taller than one of his teachers in elementary school. Um, and then moving f um, forward to high school, you know, that expectation. Is, if you see him, you don't know he's 18. He just turned 18, right? So he says that, oh, you should do this, you should be this. So you are black kids, all black kids end up in, I mean, NBA. So you should, in the bas basketball, you should do the, and I know, let him be a child. So I said, mother, I mean, we're very open. He talks to me like, you be yourself. You don't have to be the expert. But yeah, that is the expectation because of his height. And, and then when he not, I've sat through the game and I see the negativity coming from the coaches on him. 
And as soon as we get in that car, I'm like, I saw it. Just let it fry out because you know who you are. You don't have to, you know, break your bones to try to like make um, them the hero. So that and your boys, just let them know. I mean, it's, it is what it is as we continue to work on things and educate folks and educate ourselves and, you know, it is what it is. Thank you. We have another question? Okay. More like a comment here. <clears throat> I'm I'd from love it if you made it a question. <laughs> I would love to hear more from our panelists, so questions are invited. All right, comment on a question. I'll be, I'll be brief. Thank you. I am from Newmarket, and uh, I can't thank each and all of you enough for these testimonies and these challenges you brought before us today. Um, in case you haven't noticed, uh, well, let me say, I, uh, I grew up with a heavy burden on my shoulders in another culture, that is North Carolina. So the journey I made is a very long one, sometimes painful and growing and learning more and more about myself. So this has been very instructive and very helpful. Uh, do you have any other comment for me as a challenge to how I might continue to grow? Thank you for making it a question. <laughs> <laughs> um, one comment I have for you, sir, is um, uh, throughout all that has happened with my family and my uh, children here since we've moved to New Hampshire, we had not experienced any of those situations in Kentucky. And the misnomer is that the South is so rife with racism that the North is the place to be. And it has totally turned that um, uh, assumption on its head. So it all comes down to each and every person individually. And my challenge to you, my comment to you in as you grow, be an ally to someone who has a different level of melanin content than, your, than yourself. Be a, be a friend to someone. Um, we have these you know, cookouts or picnics or barbecue, and don't let me get started on where those words come from. Um, but um, how many friends that are African American do you invite to your picnic or do you invite to your Thanksgiving dinner if they're new to the town? Um, we moved here and a very lovely family in Lee that I um, stayed with my first six months while I work at UNH, they invited my family over for um, Thanksgiving dinner and it was one big grand celebration, the Masiolix from Lee um, here in New Hampshire. So be an ally, be a friend to someone else, a genuine friend, not a facade, but a genuine friend to someone who does not look like you because deep down they all have the same needs, they all have the same desires, the same um, you know, um, vision for their personal accomplishments, just like you. So be a white friend. I've had one lady from HR at UNH ask me, what can I do to make a difference, Grace? And I'm like, just be a friend to someone who does not look like you. And, and genuinely reach out to people and, and get to know them. And that's how you'll get to know about their heritage and realize that you're more alike than you are different. Does anyone else want to add to that? And then I, I'm going to close with a final question. But does anyone else have a... Uh, yeah, don't worry. Okay, um, my, my challenge to you would probably be just uh, be, be a father to someone who doesn't have one in their life because uh, the people, the men who were mentors to me um, are the reason why I'm here today. And uh, you know, it's, mentorship is so important. So if you can just find someone you know, who, who's you know, young and, and looking for a way out of their uh, disaster, you know, just reach out to them and, and kind of mentor them so that they can, you know, be successful in the future. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, I think we're going to take one more question from okay. the audience. 
This is for Betty and Lydette. I have good friends in Hampton Falls who are white and looking to adopt. And there's a young uh, black girl, nine years old in New York, who's in crisis. And they're going down to meet her. And I keep saying, you know, you guys really need to reach out and think about what you're doing. So their heart's in the right place. So what would your advice be to this couple, white couple, bringing a nine-year-old black girl to Hampton Falls, New Hampshire? Um, yeah, it's a great question, actually, and it's something that I think even my parents adopted me. Like they had, like now, like like 11 years later, to talk to me about it, and they said, "Wow, we did not know uh, what we know now, and we should have like looked into it." And I think um, for that couple, I would say, like, if you really want to do it, like, go ahead and do it. But I think what they have to understand is that this girl is coming from. Um, like a, she has a history behind her, you know. She's come, probably coming from trauma, and she has other things that she, other things that she's been through. So when she comes, um, you know, into their life, like they can't expect her to, you know, not necessarily not necessarily like not fall into line, but like they can't expect her to, um, you know, be okay, and you know, and and just kind of go into their life because she had a life before and she's going to come with you know a lot of grief a lot of loss you know and tr just trauma in general and I think it's important that they understand that they're going to be the most important in people in her life and that they're going to make the biggest impact on her life so they just have to make sure you know to keep an eye on her and for a while just let her figure things out because um, it's one of the things my parents said that they just didn't know um, until now, and they wish they knew that um, sooner. So yeah, definitely just educate yourself on what you're doing before you know you make a big move like that. Um, really similar to Ledette, you know, I think kind of as individuals in a community that's looking to dismantle these institutions is to be able to recognize your own power and privilege that you have as an individual. And I think if you're a parent of color, um, you know, you're you are their parent, so you have that authority. That is your child, and I think to be able to see that, that she does see from a different lens, one, because she is a girl of color, and, but to really be able to you know, take all those things into account when making decisions, I guess, and so just know the platform that they have as parents, but also people of color, and, and really, really challenge themselves to learn from her while you know, obviously being her parent. So I guess that's what I'd say, if that makes sense. Okay, thank you. So the final question that I want to put to all of you is, um, I have a friend who used to work at UNH who is a black woman who said, you know, it takes a lot of work for a place to stay this white. It takes work. It doesn't happen by accident. And so I think a lot about, and I live in Maine, um, and used to live in New Hampshire, and um, think about how the demographics are slowly changing in northern New England and how much we have to work to keep young people like yourselves um, wanting to stay here and grow here. And so I guess my question is, um, if you plan to stay in New England, New Hampshire, Maine, um, and if that were going to be the future you think of for yourself, to be an adult here, what would make that, what would have to happen to make that desirable? You can take a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's one of those questions that, like you said earlier on, you can decide if you want to answer or not. So it's not necessarily a, a stumped question. <laughs> um, yeah. But, but um, in all fairness to the question, it's a fair question. Um, I think uh, what I've observed coming to New Hampshire in the past um, a year and a half and living here a year and a half, then bringing my family here over the past 10 months, is that there are a lot of good people out there. And there's lots of people here in New England that makes you feel comfortable and want to remain here. Then, of course, 
um, you have to look at the social strata and how you want to raise your children. And if you are comfortable having them grow up in a climate where there are less than 1% of diversity and have them subjected to um, the different racial slurs, innuendos, abuse that they are often subjected to. Um, it's a decision that has to be carefully thought out, just like this um, uh, member of the audience, her friends are thinking to adopt um, an African-American young lady. They have to decide and they have to honestly say, are we equipped to bring her to a predominantly white state to have her um, experience these atrocities that others have experienced? What can we as white New Englanders do to make sure that when people of diverse backgrounds come to our state, that they want to stay? What can we do? How can we become an ally? How can we reach out to these people and make them feel that they are appreciated and we want them here? That's something that I think the bigger audience, the majority, needs to ask themselves. because. Um, if you're striving for a white state, you have one. And if you're striving to keep it white, you have one. So it's all a matter of what you hope to accomplish in the future. Thank you. Um, I think for myself, just thinking about you know, New England and its history, um, something we had a discussion at school was, you know, a lot of people are like, well, we're not racist here, and I'm like, because you have one black person, you know what I mean? They, they fully believe that, you know, because you're predominantly white, that is why you don't have as many, I guess, encounterments. So I think for me personally, is to take apart the institution that's there, you know what I mean? And you and recognize your history and, and flip that. And I think, I guess what I'm really trying to say is, you know, educate your people and start that within the schools and make sure these racial slurs aren't happening. And when they do, you know, within the universities and within schools and within just the communities, really take a foot down and, and stop that. So I guess just the basic things that will make people feel welcome is, you know, to make it a kind, safe place. Thank you. In, any final words from anyone else who hasn't spoken? Um, on the note of making like why I would want to stay in New England longer would be like definitely more diversity in the area, but also just um, universities and institutions being held more accountable for their responsibility in bringing forth like a more diverse um, environment for everyone to learn in. When I was um, in my sociological analysis class right now, I'm doing my um, literature review on representation in America, and I'm studying right now um, Brown versus Board of Education and the study that was done with the dolls, and it was just basically saying how um, black children feel inferior to white children, not only like in education, but in beauty standards and basically every other standard within their life. But um, that test didn't only show um, the effects of black children being um, underrepresented in the educational system, but it also showed that white children are losing out on um, a fair education from not having enough diversity within their education. And it's because we don't have more um, African Americans at the university and st like at, at UNH and stuff that I believe lots of my fellow um, white classmates are staying ignorant to certain things that they could um, benefit from, learned experiences, and um, if they just had more, if they held the children more responsible who say these ignorant comments, then I think more African Americans would want to come to UNH, but it's a really hard struggle because UNH isn't really making that many um, strides to stop like people from saying things. Those, those kids aren't really getting punished, but um, yeah, it's, it's a tough 
situation. I don't really know because it's hard for students to want to come into a university that's like predominantly white and then them being told that they're welcome, but then when things of racism happen, the university doesn't really do anything about it. So, I don't know. Go ahead, Ledette. Oh, okay. Um, I think the question um, for me personally is very adroit and very complex. I don't think there's a single answer to it because, you know, all of us have, you know, different experiences, although they're kind of similar, they are different. Um, but personally, I think I don't really want to stay around here because um, obviously there's not a lot of black representation in the state. And the other thing is, is I don't feel like black people are given a chance in, um, in the state or New England in general, because I know personally I have to work like three times as hard as all my white peers and all my white friends to earn the respect that they get on the first try. Like everybody is very open-minded um, about who they're going to be and then they you know, judge them after. For me, I show up and I have to prove them all wrong and then show them that, you know. And I think for me, it's just, it's really draining and I just don't want to be in an area where I have to work three times as hard and I'm in, it, like I said, it's, it's very draining. So for me, I think it would be really amazing if we could just have, you know, everybody uh, be surrounded by people that are just really open-minded and that are just willing to, you know, not make that first judgment because it's that first judgment um, that you make on an individual, like a black individual, that really, you know, sets the course or it can set the course of what they're going to be like you know, later on, a couple of years on, I don't think people understand that, you know, that they do have a huge influence, you know, by judging them right away. So, yeah. Thank you. I think we are at our time. And so I want to give a, um, we're going to close because we do have a few minutes of closing, but I think our panelists might be willing to speak with folks after. Um, I want to just, um, these wonderful panelists have given us a lot to think about. Um, they have given a lot of recommendations and there's clearly a role for each of us to play. So I hope we all receive that as the gift that it is. And let's thank them with another round of applause. Thank you, Caitlin. Thank you all for coming out this afternoon. This has been a wonderful, wonderful tea talk. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank this young, wonderful, intelligent, honest panelists. You gave your heart, and I think that was wonderful for us. And keep in mind, like Caitlin said, their suggestions for our future. How can you make a difference? And I'm excited because here sits our future future of New Hampshire, the future of our country. There's a lot going on there. Thank you. And in closing, I would like to invite up the president of the Black New Hampshire, the Black Heritage Trail of New Hampshire. I want to put Portsmouth in there. Um, Reverend Thompson to close us out. Thank you all. Uh, I'm so filled with admiration for you. Um, and I know that uh, part of the burden of being black in this environment is that you're always the teacher. And that gets very tiring. And I want, you to, I want to echo what, what, what you just said. You don't have to always take that role. I found that God restores me when I get exhausted and it gets exhausting. Uh, and then I can go on and engage again. But I have to decide that I'm going to do that. And I want to just raise to everyone that what we've heard is a lot of information and every one of them spoke about how critical their own identity formation was. But what I, I'm aware of having raised two children in Exeter, New Hampshire, is that um, uh, if, 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 if you don't have a lot of uh, affirmation, cultural affirmation in your home or, or even uh, uh, historical information given to you, what you're learning about black people is what you see on television and what you might hear through the media. And that's true whether you happen to be a black child or a white child. So that a black child grows up with the same, a black child who grows up in New Hampshire has the same negative 
impressions or limited impressions of black people that all the white folks do. So that's a real problem, which underscores the importance of education. So I'm happy to say that one of the things that we're doing to make this state more attractive to blacks is by strengthening the Black Heritage Trail of New Hampshire. These programs, I think, do a great deal. You do a great deal by coming here. Um, and so I want to just remind you that in every program, there is a donation packet. Now, I am a preacher, and we do, we are accustomed in my tradition, at least, to asking for money pretty easily. But I just really have a serious thought for you, and I, I would really appreciate it if each of you would contribute something. I don't know what, how you would monetize the value of what you just heard. I don't know what amount of money you would put to it. And if you've been to other tea talks, I don't know what you would pay for that if you had to pay something. But I just want to encourage you to be as generous as you can because this programming happens all too infrequently in our state. And here we are trying to do something so that black kids and white kids who grew up in the state will know, oh yeah, black folks have been in New Hampshire for a long time and they, they've done this, 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 and this. So I thank you all. I really encourage you and support you and applaud you and say right on, right on, right on, right on, right on, right on, right on. And I invite and I thank all of you for coming and for supporting us through this whole season. Thank you very much. Yeah.